Uh, welcome to this geoscience colloquium. And there, I'm just guessing there are few others who are also from um, from North Carolina University here. Uh, I don't I, I don't see them. I don't understand. Don't know the names. Uh, but welcome to all. Uh, and this colloquium is is co-hosted by Auburn's NRT program on climate resilience and also Alabama View, a remote sensing consortium in celebration of Earth Observation Day. Today's speaker is Dr. Shudarshana Mukhopadhyay. She is a postdoctoral research associate in the Stein Schneider Lab at Cornell University. Her primary research area is statistical hydrology with an emphasis on stochastic hydrological modeling that aims at efficiently using climate information in various resource uh, management. She has earned her PhD in civil construction and environmental engineering with specialization in climate hydrology and water resources, uh, resource modeling in January 2020 from North Carolina State University. Shadarshana is a former USGS Global Change Fellow of Southeast Climate Adaptation Center, Science Center, a former graduate visitor fellow at NCAR, and a former DAAD Fellow, which is the German Academic Exchange Service. Her research has been published in many renowned journals, including scientific reports of nature. Uh, the paper, the you know, what she's going to present, um, what she's published in this particular paper. Uh, so with no further uh, delay, I will transfer the virtual mic to Dr. Mukhopadhyay to begin her talk. Thank you, Chandana. Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, so I'll just quickly share my screen and start the seminar. Maybe the co-host, so it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Can you share, can you see the screen? Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for hosting me today. So, uh, I guess it's good afternoon or good evening from wherever you are tuning in. Thank you for joining me, uh, especially in these trying times. I'm really excited to share with you our recent work on uh, developing a river basin scale hydrological connectivity between stream gauges and reservoir network. So this work started off as a small segue from a different USGS project during my PhD and got a life of its own. So imagine Google uh, here, yeah, imagine in Google Maps, uh, uh, if the rivers become roads and we need to navigate through the river network from one infrastructure to another. I'll talk about an approach we developed to create such network maps. I won't go into excruciating detail, but would love to take your questions at the end. And feel free to interrupt if, you, if I use uh, any term that you are not familiar with. So here's a little bit of uh, my research background. Chandana already mentioned some of uh, my research interest. In simple terms, I focus on efficiently using climate information in water resources management for different time scale, ranging from 15 days to months to seasons, also over annual time scale. I study effect of climate on driving local to regional scale hydrological responses like rainfall, stream flow, temperature, et cetera. I use statistical models to link large scale climate information with local weather. I also work on multi-reservoir system models that focus on water, food, and energy nexus. So during my PhD, I had a chance to collaborate with uh, ecologists and other hydrologists uh, in an interdisciplinary project uh, from USGS Powell Center. They are located in Fort Collins, Colorado. So for that project, we were interested in understanding basin scale effects of dams on biodiversity especially in a highly regulated basin. 
So uh, by highly regulated basin, I mean, if we have a large number of reservoirs in a uh, watershed. So, so when we started the work, we soon realized that there is no data on interconnectedness of dams in a river network over a regional scale. Basically, we needed to uh, create a Google map where rivers become roads. And that's where the present work comes to rescue. Now, geographical proximity does not guarantee hydrological connectivity. Simply put, two locations may be close to each other, but belong to different watersheds or not connected by a river or stream at all. Just simply uh, imagine a ridge between those two uh, locations. So when we uh, look at this, the hydrological connectivity becomes really important for infrastructures such as reservoirs, water treatment plants, or power plants for their safe operation. It is also essential to know how far, say, a power plant is from a river during an extreme flood. The knowledge of this river network connectivity is also useful when we are interested in regional water management. For example, coordinating water releases from upstream reservoirs so that it doesn't harm downstream biodiversity and critical settlements. So where does the challenge lie? Existing methods like watershed delineation is not suitable uh, or rather to say easy to use over a large watershed linking thousands of different kinds of infrastructures with complex river networks. In this work, we proposed a solution to the problem. We propose a tool for digitally linking physical features to hydrological network. This is a snapshot of the uh, paper that I'll be discussing in detail. You can find it on uh, their website. It's an open access paper. So uh, before I uh, go into technical detail, I just like to thank Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center for supporting my co-author uh, Chandramoli and myself uh, through their Global Change Fellowship Program. So um, in this paper, we talk about how to use this tool for developing hydrologic connectivity of infrastructure, like stream gauges and reservoirs across a large river networks. This connectivity can be particularly important and challenging to create for highly managed river basin, such as Colorado River Basin. In this figure, uh, I'm showing dams uh, as in uh, red triangles and the black dots represent the stream gauges. The blue lines are the flow lines. The numbers uh, in the legend for flow lines is not relevant to this uh, talk, but the, I uh, like grayed out some of the uh, flow lines just for visual uh, effectiveness. So for Colorado, we are linking about 1400 reservoirs and 1600 stream cages and make, uh, starting their interconnectedness over these uh, large uh, river network ex uh, extending from upper and lower Colorado Basin. And we are presenting this data set uh, using this tool as a network graph and saving it as an edge list. So for Colorado Basin uh, case study, the river reservoir data comes from National Inventory of Dams or NID and the stream gauge data comes from USGS. And the hydrological data or the river uh, spatial data comes from uh, NHD plus data set. So I'll talk about the algorithm in a bit, but before that, uh, let's quickly talk about the river flow line data that I used. The spatial information on river network comes from National Hydrographic Dataset or NHD. 
the developed algorithm can link any number of spatial point data with the recent high resolution in HD data only by using some vector attributes. The shape files contains river information as polylines. Individual line segments have unique IDs. Together, these segments make a river ridge. They also have unique IDs. So by looking at these uh, unique IDs, we can differentiate between one uh, res uh, river, say Colorado, from say another like Lee's Perry. Now, before I uh, delve deep into the algorithm, let's uh, quickly uh, see how the data looks like in the in HD plus data set. So don't get scared of these tables. You don't have to uh, like pay attention to the uh, text here. I'm just trying to highlight some, uh, that the different kinds of vector attributes that we are using here. Now, um, consider this as a warning for overwhelming animation that I am going to show you. So uh, I'm going to talk about the algorithm in a uh, bit detail. So let's dive in. So the basic idea is this. We have a river network. And along those river networks, we have dams and stream gauges. Now, uh, here on the uh, top left corner, this is a like a cartoon of river network. And the uh, circles are stream gauges. And I have these uh, dam like uh, cartoon for reservoirs, denoting reservoirs. And all these informations are coming as shape files. And our goal is to create a network data, uh, unidirectional graph, and save it as an edge list in, in a shape, uh, CSV file or comma separated uh, value file. So this is basically a table that will have these columns like from node and to node, and it will uh, tell you what those nodes are and uh, edges will have different attributes. I'll come into that. Uh, so these are the basic uh, input and output structure that we need to follow. So the uh, in the algorithm, there are two main steps. One is data preparation, and then the second step is network analysis. In the data preparation, we first uh, need to snap the points to nearest lines. In this step, we compare distance between a point and river segment within a buffer distance. Now, this buffer distance can vary depending on our specific application. And uh, depending on the buffer uh, distance, the accuracy of uh, the snapping uh, step will change. So all the details can be found in the paper. We, I am showing this link here. Uh, so along with those buffer distances, we also compare the names of the river segments and the point using a fuzzy string matching criteria. And this is quite important, especially when we use spatial data from different sources, different projections, and with varying degree of detail. Next, we start the network analysis. Here, we start by traversing the river network from headwaters all the way to the outlet of the watershed. We group the rivers uh, by unique IDs the dams and the gauges are already linked to these uh, IDs. Using a recursive uh, method, we traverse the entire network while considering different limiting conditions. Now, this limiting condition can be like a start of uh, a network or end of a network, like uh, a uh, network without any downstream connection, then a, uh, presence of a coastline, which is uh, crucial, which was crucial for uh, basins in uh, lower uh, Colorado. Then a flow line connection, uh, like a junction that can be convergent, divergent, or complex uh, connection. Then once we uh, do this network analysis, the output is saved as an edge list 
where nodes of the network are infrastructures, dams and stream gauges in this case. The edges uh, linking the pair of nodes are the river flow lines between them. So now um, that I have described this uh, algorithm in a broader sense, let me dive a little bit deeper into the algorithm. I, I'll go uh, step by step and describe each of the process. And uh, if uh, you find it hard to follow, please interrupt. If there is anything I missed, please feel free to interrupt me. So the step one, as I mentioned, is the data preparation. And in the data preparation, a big chunk of the work is snapping the points. Uh, and this is very crucial. The next, uh, next point is uh, we need to calculate the distance from headwaters using this uh, attribute called arbolate sum. So, any text that you see uh, in italics is coming from uh, an HD plus data set. I'll just tell you what that represent and uh, more details. Uh, for more details, you can look at the paper. So what basically uh, happening here is once we have identified the nearest flow lines for a given point, we want to calculate uh, or we want to know how far it is from headwaters, that is the start of the network. And once we uh, calculate these distances, then we can arrange the data uh, and using other attrib vector attributes, all of them, all of these italic te uh, text are representing uh, different vector attributes from the NHD data set. Uh, all of these attributes uh, are stored and they link to the uh, point shape files. And the point data set, uh, here I'm denoting the number of points as NP. Here, the NP has both gauges and dams together. So the NID dams have a unique ID called NID ID. And uh, these are unique to uh, each dam in uh, all the uh, states. And then the USGS site numbers are uh, unique identifiers for stream gauges. So when I'm joining these two, two uh, point information, I'm creating a separate unique ID, like a point one, point two, like this, but also keeping the original uh, source specific IDs and their names, everything together in the uh, database. But uh, using, I mean, by creating an another uh, unique identity, yeah, unique ID for the points, we can virtually join any number of point information in here and use this uh, network tool. So once we join the data uh, or the point data, uh, these work as the input for network analysis. In the network analysis, our ultimate goal is to create an edge list. So edge list basically represents a from node and to node connection. Now, uh, there are a few steps. I will uh, go over them individually. The first step, as I mentioned earlier, is to start from headwater. Headwater are the most upstream points of a river network. So, and this algorithm can start from multiple starting point. So it works in parallel and not in sequence. So one in the headwaters, we filter the uh, points that are in the headwater lines and we group them by this uh, ID called COM ID. Now we are actually mixing the uh, attributes of the point uh, data with the NHD plus hydrologic data. So every uh, uh, point in point data now has a unique COM ID, which is the COM ID of nearest flow lines where we have snapped the point. Now for each uh, group of uh, points that are on the headwaters or the most upstream locations, 
we group them and sort them uh, based on their distance from the upstream node. Uh, and then this forms, uh, this information goes to the edge list. Now we again start from the downstream most point of the headwaters. Uh, so each step basically starts from the downstream level of the uh, previous step. So if we have uh, looked at like 500 points in the headwaters, the bottom uh, or the downstream most uh, 100 points say uh, of those 500 points are uh, the starting points for the next step. So then in the next step, uh, we uh, do the network traversal following the main flow path. Now, when I say main flow path and uh, or minor flow path, I basically using I'm basically using some terminal uh, terminology that comes from the hydrologic data set uh, of the NHD data. So these main flow path and minor flow path had some unique definitions. I'll come to that. It basically means if I am following, uh, if I am doing this network traversal and I'm going from upstream to downstream following a particular river, say Colorado River, uh, then I'll continue along the Colorado River. Uh, unless I'm, uh, I mean, Colorado River is a main river, but unless I have a uh, river that is uh, flowing from Colorado, I'll not change my path. So if I am starting, if I am going along the main path, I'll continue to uh, go along the main uh, along the main channel and not go to go to the minor uh, flow lines. So as I mentioned before, I'll uh, start from the downstream most points that we that I have already visited in the last step and then follow the uh, network uh, in the, along the main flow path with the remaining number of points. That is, if I am considering th 3,000 points, then I'll consider, uh, suppose, 2,000 points, I mean, remaining 2,000 points in this step. Uh, now, I mentioned in my previous slide that I'm using a recursive function. This recursive function is basically a um, depth first search uh, algorithm of network analysis. So uh, this recursive function uh, basically moves along the river network and it stops uh, when a network uh, cry stopping criteria or network uh, ending criteria is met. And depending on the path that I have to it will either go uh, along the main river path or it will look for some small uh, branches in the network. So I'll not go into like nitty gritty of this uh, recursive function. Basically what it does is it uh, considers different uh, vector attributes of the NHD data uh, and does this uh, network analysis in a recursive manner that I already said. And uh, whenever it is uh, facing a junction node, like a divergent or a complex junction or a convergent junction, uh, it will ask the user whether it will look for the path that I'm calling uh, the value of the path. If path is main that I'm following in, along the main path, it will follow the main path. Or uh, if it's a minor path, then it will uh, follow the minor path. So that is the basic idea. And all these uh, paths are uh, defined based on some vector attributes that are coming from the National Hydrographic Data Set. And based on this uh, recursive traversal, it will create a, uh, it will uh, keep on populating the edge list, that is the to and from uh, connection of nodes. And uh, we should keep in mind that in this step, the nodes are either stream gauges or uh, reservoirs. It can be any point data that we are using. And the algorithm itself doesn't differentiate between a type of node. 
like type of the uh, stream uh, whether the node is stream gauge or dam the algorithm doesn't see that so it equally uh, treats all the nodes and create this network connection. So once uh, we have traveled along the main path, we'll go along the minor path and populate the adjacency matrix. It's basically a big matrix that we'll have in this Colorado case, we have total 3000 points. So it's a big 3000 by 3000 matrix where rows represent uh, from connections and Column, but along columns, we have two nodes or uh, two uh, connect, two node connection. And basically, it's a big sparse matrix. So, for saving, um, for computational efficiency, basically, we are uh, creating this edge list from this matrix so that it will have a uh, different, it will have these to and from node connection along uh, in a very concise way uh, in different columns. So this is the algorithm that we have developed here. And um, using this algorithm, we developed the data set for Colorado River Basin. So all these data sets and the codes are available online. The input data set, as I have mentioned, are the reservoir data, which is saved as uh, nid.csv, this file. And the stream gauge data uh, as, uh, uh, is also there in the uh, input data set. We are also uploading. Uh, we are also uploading the uh, NHT plus data set that we particularly used for this analysis. Now, the uh, we are saving this data because the NHT plus data is uh, like constructed in such a way that it is for different watersheds. But if we look at the Colorado River Basin, uh, we are considering both the upper Colorado and lower Colorado. So we have combined those two data set to create the input file. So we have kept that data set is also online. And the final output uh, that we generated using the algorithm is saved as this edge list.csv and it has these columns that is basically showing the from node and to node connections. And uh, all the codes are available on GitHub. Uh, you can uh, access them and you can uh, create this data set for other uh, basins as well. So this is how the data set look like. Uh, the data, uh, the red and blue boxes are showing the different uh, kinds of information that we are storing in the uh, storing in the data set. Some of the attributes that come from the points uh, information, point data, like dams and stream gauges are here. Uh, and the data set also says you know, what is the uh, node type, right? whether it's a dam or gauge. And the names contain the unique ID that is coming from the source of the specific point data. And for example, if we are looking at a reservoirs, then it will have this NID ID uh, and the re reservoir names. Similarly, if we are looking at a USGS stream gauge, it will have the site number along with the uh, stream gauge name. Now, one of the uh, use of this data set is to calculate distance uh, between any uh, point along a river along the river network. So this is a snippet of the uh, code that is already again on the GitHub. So here I'm basically calculating the distance between uh, Glen Canyon Dam and Hoover Dam uh, along the river network. So Glen Canyon is the outlet of Upper uh, Colorado River Basin, and we are using this function called find distance uh, to calculate the distance between the Glen Canyon and Hoover. And this uh, distance calculation or network traversal can be done in both upstream or downstream direction. So 
from this, uh, we can uh, basically what we are doing is we are traveling from uh, Glen Canyon to Hoover, but not by road, rather by Colorado River. Now, using this data set, you, uh, one can also uh, do much uh, detailed network traversal for specific uh, re research questions. Now, um, I would like to talk about uh, like the actual study that motivated the present work that I'm uh, discussing with you. So for this study, we use the uh, recon uh, data set that is river reservoir uh, that is the river connectivity network data set that we developed for Colorado River Basin. So in this study, we were interested in understanding uh, the propagation of flow alteration uh, across large, highly regulated basin, such as Colorado. And we wanted to understand uh, how these flow alterations affect the uh, biodiversity, both in terms of local uh, dam attributes and also in terms of network specific attributes. So uh, in ecology, uh, people usually look at flow alteration. Um, okay, so flow alteration basically means that the level of stream flow is changing so much uh, that there is some regime alteration and it's affecting some native species in the uh, region. I mean, I'm not an ecologist, but this is like a basic principle. So uh, in the uh, field of ecology, people usually look at this uh, problem of flow alteration from a single dam specific uh, point. So here in this study, we saw that the cascade of dams upstream of a given location also affect the flow alteration and impacts the biodiversity of a specific location. Even uh, we found that the, the effect of the river network or the location of, of a particular dam uh, in the river network and the cascade of the upstream dams and their releases alters the uh, biodiversity alters the flow regimes more significantly than the uh, single individual dam that we are considering. So more details on this work can be found in this paper. Uh, so if, uh, this actually led us to different uh, ongoing work using this uh, algorithm and this database. Currently, we are working on uh, creating a national database of reservoirs and stream gauges along with uh, power plants for entire uh, US. Uh, we, and this is in collaboration with USGS and Kwasi. We are also working on a very interesting uh, project uh, with Texas EM and University. Uh, this is an NSA funded project uh, where we are looking at regional flood hazards and we are trying to uh, analyze the water quality uh, and the water quality mapping uh, and monitoring uh, system uh, using this algorithm. And uh, the study area for this particular work is Mississippi River Basin. And we are really excited to see that uh, this work is drumming up interest among different stakeholders across different fields. So lastly, I like to thank USGS Powell Center for giving me this uh, opportunity to work with them and develop this database and the algorithm. And don't forget to explore Recon on Figshare. All the links are here. So. With that, I'd conclude my talk and I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukhubada. This was, uh, this was uh, really a very interesting and, uh, um, and, and you know, for me, it was the first time I'm really understanding, trying to understand what goes on with rivers and the, the connectivity and what the benefits are. So, um, 
what we'll do is we have we have enough time and what we can do is we can you know, open the floor for questions and this is the floor the virtual floor for questions and um, and then you can address address those so anyone if you if you have any questions you don't have to raise your hand but just go ahead and unmute and ask a question um please anyone you i have a question it's it's stephanie so uh i actually study rivers and um, I, I am actually working on a database that has uh, the dam, a future dam construction across the, the globe, not just in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was looking at, you know, paying attention to how you were talking about the looking at connectivity. Because it'd be really interesting to run similar analysis on future dams. Um, but I realize I am not aware, although I do have river network data. I'm not aware of how it compares to the USGS blue line data that you were using. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the requirements for the river data? What, like how uh, robust does that data set need to be to make this work? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, let me uh, go back to presentation mode. My laptop is freezing for some reason. Okay, so uh, to, that's an excellent question, uh, Steph. So, I'm uh, using the national hydrographic data set uh, that is for obviously US, but they also have a global data set, which is a similar high resolution data set. But the problem is in the version that I used, the global data set uh, didn't have all the vector attributes that were uh, I was using, but in their um, in their like uh, handbook, they actually specifies, uh, I mean, they actually give all the step-by-step -step procedure that one can follow to populate those attributes. I mean, uh, the data quality is not great for all the major river basin in the world. But the point data set you already have that you mentioned, you have the future dam data. Uh, if you just look at, uh, the global data set uh, from NHD, you will see what are the attributes uh, they are missing and if at all they are missing anything because they are releasing another version of this data set. But the uh, uh, key thing is if you have the vector attributes that I mentioned, uh, that uh, then you can create this data set for any uh, watershed. Thank you. So you can find, check the paper uh, for the ex and the codes actually that are in the GitHub uh, to understand what exactly I'm using. Uh, these are, uh, I'm not using like 100 different attributes. There are, there are very few key features that I'm using, which are, uh, which should be readily available. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other question? Um, so I have a question and that this could be more of a curiosity thing because I'm, I'm still pretty mesmerized with all the algorithms you showed. Um, and so, yeah, so my, my, my question, my curiosity question was that how do you, you know, we, we know climate change is happening and how does all of this fit into climate change as, as what the future entails for us and how would this study you know, benefit uh, the changes we would see in future? Okay, um, so some of my research uh, uh, interest that I discussed in the beginning of my talk uh, is uh, like focused on actual hydrological response of climate change. But this particular work, uh, this connectivity network, uh, can be used uh, for re, uh, reimagining the operations, like how we handle our water systems. And if we have a uh, proper understanding of the locations, then we can save the infrastructure. So. When I um, started the uh, talk, I talked about how this data set is crucial for infrastructure operation, their safe operation. And 
suppose we have a power plant, like nuclear power plant, and the uh, nuclear power plants take water from rivers be, uh, for cooling their reactors. Now, if, a, uh, if there is a flooding condition in the river, that information has to uh, be available at the managers at the nuclear power plant. So for extreme uh, climate events or for climate change where we have to uh, re, uh, re, uh, imagine the op present operating systems, this kind of detailed uh, network data can be very useful. The another uh, uh, example that I showed for Colorado Basin, where we looked at the impacts of dams in uh, biodiversity, that was basically pushing the uh, water resources manager to change their uh, current operation uh, policies so that it can incorporate uh, more uh, leeway for the uh, native species. So with the, uh, this kind of alteration, actually this data set will be very much useful uh, in a like when the extremes become the new normal. Well, thank you. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a that's a very um, good answer to my um, you know, for the curiosity thing I had. The other thing which I was thinking is uh, before I can ask others if anyone has a question is I'm thinking of Mekong Valley or you know the Himalayan uh, region where we know that a lot of dams are being built right after IPCC five. You know where they said that all the most of the glaciers are going to vanish in whatever number of years, and so. Um, you know, so do you, and we know that in Mekong Valley, even seeing the remote sensed images, uh, they are kind of blurry because they won't let us see what's going on there. And so, do you think in the future, um, you know, this this could? I'm sure you are maybe already doing. A, you said you're doing a global database. So, do you mm -hmm. think actually get some bit, you know, do something of of this type there in other in Mekong Valley or the Helen region? I mean, uh, I don't have a clear answer to that question. That's a, a difficult question. Um, Sorry so, about that. You know, uh, <laughs> basically, when you uh, talk about the availability of data in Asian countries, especially I'm from India, I know how scarce the data is there. Um, I mean, this is where... Uh, the local stakeholders uh, need to come in, but from a purely scientific point of view, um, I'd say that uh, with the glo uh, global NHD data set, there is some hope of developing this kind of detailed network data for other countries. And uh, I mean, would, if we can demonstrate properly that see the dams, or the re we need to uh, reoperate the uh, uh, policies of hand these river managements or reservoir management. Uh, maybe we can like motivate stakeholders from other countries to actually uh, initiate this uh, process and uh, make the, some uh, good data available for use. Like if we can show that changing the operation in Colorado Basin, for example, actually can benefit some native species or improve the biodiversity, make it, maybe uh, dams or the uh, man, water resources managers in Himalayans or Mekong Valley will understand what is the need of the hour and make some changes. But that is like a, yeah, a long shot. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Well, I was just going to jump in and say because the two data sets I'm working with are actually the the that the one that's the dams, the future dam construction. It's it's free. It's freely avail available from the World Wildlife Fund, and it, there's a separate paper that was already written about it that was published in Nature, I think. Um, but there's also we're working with data sets on all the global protected lands, and so what we're modeling is the potential for those lands to be impacted by reduced flows or controlled flows from dams. And so it sounds like the work that, that you're talking about here would actually be very complementary to that. That would really make a more robust data set. So yeah. I look forward to actually reading the paper and seeing if I can 
make those connections. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. So I don't think we have any more um, questions coming from uh, uh, Brennan. I, okay. No. I just saw you suddenly have your video on. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Mukhopadhyay because it was it was an enriching um, talk, and uh, yes, um, and thank you very much for for you know coming to our colloquium, and uh, we look forward to a further maybe collaboration and you know discussion on these topics. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay.